Welcome back. Today I'll be showing how to set up the GPIO pins on a Raspberry Pi so that they can be used with your own custom Python programs. The GPIO pins allow the Raspberry Pi to interface with a wide range of hardware, including custom built circuits for almost any application you can think of. If you're interested in learning more about circuits and electrical engineering, then be sure to check out my series, Practical Electronics and Circuits 101. The latest video in that series talks about transistors and demonstrates how to design simple transistor-based circuits which can be used to control lights and motors from a Raspberry Pi, among other devices as well. That video focuses on the hardware and electrical aspects, while today's video will cover how to set up the software side of it. Now I'll actually be showing how to set up two different libraries today. The first library is called rpi.gpio, and it allows you to control the GPIO pins from Python programs running directly on the Raspberry Pi. This is the most straightforward way to control the pins. But depending on what you're doing, you might require more processing power than what the Pi can deliver. So I'll also be showing how to set up remote GPIO, which will allow you to control the GPIO pins from a remote computer connected on your local network. For example, I previously did a series of videos showing how to set up your own AI-powered security camera that utilizes YOLO object detection. My particular setup uses a Raspberry Pi camera which streams the video over my local network to a desktop PC that runs YOLO on a GPU. I'm planning to add a light next to the camera which will be controlled by the desktop PC. So this is an example where I'll need to use the remote GPIO library. Alright, so let's get started. I've posted a written guide on my website which will serve as an accompaniment to this video. The link is in the video description. Also, I'll be using DietPi as the operating system rather than the regular Raspberry Pi OS since it offers a few small improvements, but this guide should work on both. If you're interested in using DietPi, I've also made a guide for that as well. Now the first thing we'll do is install the required Python software packages and the rpi.gpio package. If running dietpy, then you could use the GUI method. First type sudo dietpy-software and then navigate to search software and enter Python. You should be given three results. Press spacebar to select the following two packages, python3 rpi.gpio and the other one is simply called Python 3. Confirm the selection, then go to install and enter OK. Alternatively, you can also install these packages from the command line. This is what you'll need to do if running the regular Raspberry Pi OS. The commands are listed here on my written guide. After the packages are installed, next enter this command to add your user to the GPIO group. This gives you hardware access to the pins. Next, reboot the Pi before continuing. Now we're ready to test it out. First, enter nano space test.py to create a new file. Then copy and paste this test code. Before I run it, let's quickly go through the code and explain what each line does. The first two lines of the code import the required libraries. The next three lines are where we configure the GPIO pins. So let's take a look at the documentation for this library to see what each line does. I provided the link to the documentation here. Now the set mode function can either be set to gpio.board or gpio.bcm. This determines which numbering scheme to use. I've included a picture on my site that shows the pin numbers. You'll notice each pin has two different numbering schemes. The physical pins themselves are numbered from 1 to 40, but most of the pins also have a GPIO number next to them. The pins that are labeled GPIO are the ones that can be set as either an input or an output. The number following the GPIO is how the pin is identified by the CPU. It's up to you which numbering scheme you want to use. 
To use the 1 through 40 numbering, you'll want to select gpio.board for this function. And to use the GPIO numbering scheme, you'll want to select gpio.bcm. I'm using gpio.board in this example. Now the next line isn't really necessary, but in some cases you might encounter warning messages that aren't really necessary to know, in which case you can enter this line to hide those warnings. Now the next line is where we set up each individual pin that we plan to use. The first argument is the pin number, and again, this will depend on which numbering scheme you selected. Since I selected gpio.board, the number 8 here references this pin. The next argument can either be set to gpio.out or gpio.in, depending whether you want the pin to be an output or an input. I'll just be using output pins for today's example. The last argument specifies the initial state of the output pin. Typically you'll want the initial state to be off, in which case you'll set this to gpio.low. But in some cases you might want the initial state to be on, in which case you'll want to set this to gpio.high. If you plan on using more than one pin, you can either do a separate setup function for each pin, or you can pass a list of pins to the function in order to set up multiple pins in one line. The next section of code is the main loop for the program. All it does is turn on the output pin for one second, then turns it off for one second, and then repeats the cycle indefinitely. You'll see that the gpio.output function is used to change the state of the output pin. All you need to do is provide the pin number as the first argument, and then provide the state you want that pin to be. This is just a simple demonstration, but hopefully it's clear how to use the output pins. Now let's run the program. After copying and pasting the code, press Ctrl X to exit the editor, and then select Yes to save the file. Now enter python3 test.py, and the program should start running. In this example I've connected that output pin to a transistor which is powering 4 LEDs. Again, if you'd like to learn how to design the electrical circuit part of this, then be sure to watch my series, Practical Electronics and Circuits 101. The link is in the video description. Alternatively, you can also test that the program is working by simply connecting a multimeter. Connect the black lead to one of the Pi's ground pins, and connect the red lead to the output pin. And you should see about 3 volts on the multimeter when the pin is on. When you're ready to move on, press Ctrl C to exit the program. Alright, so that's how you would control the GPIO pins from a program running directly on the Pi. But now let's see how to control the pins from a remote computer connected to your local network. I've included a link to the document showing how to do this on my written guide here. So the first thing we'll need to do is install the Pi GPIO package on the Pi. If you're using the desktop version of Raspberry Pi OS, then this package should already be installed. But if you're running the light version of Raspberry Pi OS or Diet Pi like I am, then you'll need to install this package. Now the next thing we need to do is start Pi GPIO. There are multiple ways to do this, either by using systemctl or by running Pi GPIO manually. For some reason the systemctl method wasn't working for me, so I'll just use the manual method. Simply enter sudo pygpiod to start it. Keep in mind that each time you restart the pi, you'll need to re-enter this command. So chances are you'll probably want to add this command to an auto start script. To do this on dietpy, enter sudo dietpy-config, go to auto start options, then custom script with auto login. Now paste the command, exit and save the file, and select root as the user. Now we need to install the necessary software on the control computer. If the control computer is another Raspberry Pi, then you'll follow these steps here. Since I'm using a Linux computer, I'll scroll down and follow these steps. Make sure you have Python and pip installed first. Next, install the GPIO0 and PyGPIO packages with pip. 
Normally you don't want to use sudo when installing pip packages, so I'm not sure why they included sudo in this command. It shouldn't make too much of a difference though, so either way should be fine. The instructions for setting this up on Mac OS and Windows are also provided here as well, but I won't be covering those. Now we can run a test program to see if it works. There are multiple ways to do this. The first method shown here uses environment variables to indicate the IP address of the Pi we want to control. You can set this environment variable when starting the program like you see here. If you choose this method, you'll want to copy and paste this test code here, and then modify the pin number. However, I'll be using the second method which doesn't use environment variables. Instead, you'll simply specify the IP address of your Pi in the code itself. This method is more flexible as it allows you to control multiple Pis from a single program. So I'll copy and paste this code to a new file on my PC and modify the IP address and the pin number. Keep in mind that the numbering scheme for this library follows the BCM numbering, and there's no way to change it as far as I know. This means that if I want to control pin 8 like I did in the previous example, I'll need to set the pin number to 14 this time. Next, exit and save, and now I'll run the program. If it works correctly, the program shouldn't output anything on the control computer. But as we can see here, the lights are flashing as expected, so we know it's working as intended. Also, there are several more examples on this page that might be useful, so I encourage you to read through the rest of the document to gain a better understanding of how to use the library. But the steps I covered today should serve as a solid introduction. Also, it's worth mentioning that some of the pins are capable of outputting a PWM signal, which is useful for various applications including controlling the speed of motors and the brightness of LEDs. But I'll be covering this another time when we do a project that requires PWM. Like I mentioned before, I'm planning to do projects on the channel that utilize microcontrollers, Raspberry Pis, and other single board computers. So the steps I covered today will be necessary if you want to follow along with those projects which utilize a Raspberry Pi. But anyway, that wraps up today's video. If you found it to be useful then be sure to give the video a thumbs up and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already so you can stay up to date with new projects. And if you have any thoughts or questions then feel free to drop a comment. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.